Honestly, it's like Rod, Hull and Emu, it just doesn't stop. <laughs> Hello everyone, welcome to <laughs> Talking About Season 6, Part 3 of 3. 6, Part 3 of 3. Yay, I can, I can do it, I can do it. Um, previously, shall I do the scores? I'll do the scores first before I introduce the other two old Marys. Previously, um, in our last two videos, we scored the Dominators 14, the Mind Robber 26, the Invasion 30, and the Crotons 16 and a half, which means the Invasion is our current front runner. But this is still three stories to go. And joining me today, I'm Paul Opiva, get the cap in. Uh, joining me today, as ever, are... Hello, it's James. And hello, it's Jason. <laughs> What's he laughing at? It's... What's, what's, what's funny about that? Well, yeah, anyway. I'm, still, I'm still laughing at three, two, one, but I'm. I'm yeah. I was. I was worried you didn't get the uh, enough screen time on your introduction, Jason. Is that what it was? No, I had plenty. I'm done. I'm. I'm perfectly happy with the representation I had there. We're one happy, friendly bunch. Um, I am going to start then because our first story is a Doctor Who and the Seeds of Death. It feels like you should pan across the moon mm. oh, with a bombastic so. Simpson. Who's got a pre-scripted intro for Doctor Who and the Seeds of Death, then? Oh, well, I was going <laughs> <laughs> to... It's, it's, it's the Ice Warriors foam party. It was my, uh, my pre-scripted thing. So, um, yes, we are... Um, re it's the return of the Ice Warriors, and this time they've decided to... Uh, try and take over the earth using the TMAT system and uh, a very ingenious plot to try and turn the atmosphere of earth to the same as Mars so that they can uh, colonize and the TARDIS crew are thrown into yet another adventure. Um, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a good story. I like this one and I've watched it a couple of times recently and um, yeah, I enjoy it. Why have you watched it a couple of times recently? I'm asking for the viewer at home. Uh, so there was a, a group that I watched it with a couple of months ago and I re-watched it for our review. So it's always a different experience when you're watching it with a group of people. I've noticed this with the BFI screenings as well. So uh, you, you, you get, uh, you know, you can play off the reactions of other people rather than just watching it yourself. And um, yeah, it's... It's, it's quite an interesting experience to watch it with a group of people. The first time I watched this story um, was on a 60 minute video compilation on a VHS that came out some years ago. 60 it minutes? Went, it was, Is that it, true? It literally was 60 minutes, I'm sure it was, because I, I, I felt quite disappointed. Um, it was edited down quite heavily. Jason, is that one of James's facts that you've stolen off him and you've not checked it? Well, I remember it. I mean, it, I will say it was several, it was many years ago. Um, so it might have been 90 minutes, but I remember it being edited to. Was it, was, it beta, was it Betamax rather than VHS? No, we didn't have a Betamax. We couldn't afford Betamax. So we it's real VHS. to real. Hmm? <laughs> hmm? Real to real, did you just say? I think, Jason, with your foggy memory here, and I'm, I, I'm just acting as a fact checker on the system, Brain of Morbius came out as a 60 minute VHS, B to Max, whatever. When The Seeds of Death came out, it was edited, but it was just the title sequence that they took off. It didn't oh, touch you are else. right. Yes, you are right. It wasn't edited down to 60 minutes. I'll stand corrected there, but I was robbed. Do you of remember the... yesterday, Jason? Is it all right? I struggle with it sometimes, but I was robbed of that fabulous title sequence throughout the episodes because I think, you know, I like this story um, quite a lot, I've got to say. And um, one of the things I like particularly about it is the title sequence. So it starts each week and it swings around. You're either on the moon or you're on the earth. Um, and it would be, it, it essentially sets where you're going to be in that episode. So if you start in the episode on earth, it shoots the other way and so on and so forth for the moon. So it's quite an intelligent little, little bit of a, a film insert there. Yeah, I don't think the entire episodes are based on the moon or on the earth, are they though? Uh, episode three, it sort of panders in between because they're actually, they start off and they're not, they're in space. Right. 
Well, I think I think viewers in the early '90s with the VHS must have been absolutely bereft. The funny thing about the whole the whole editing thing was that they used to chop and change in quality, didn't they? So episode one was like shot in a snowstorm, and then it sort of perks up. So I I, I think that was one of the more noticeable elements of a compilation VHS. I don't know about your moon sequencing, but um, so the return of the ice warriors, are, are they, I think they're probably better here than they are in the first story. I, I think they are. I quite like the first one, but this one, they, they have more menace and they, they certainly, um, you know, they're, they're quite, <laughs> quite bloodthirsty. They kill off most of the technicians. Um, you know, they, they are quite, ruthless um and and, and I, I like the way that they sort of they've got this plan plan there's not that many of them i mean they only send one down to to earth to go to the weather control station the rest of them are on the uh, on the base you know and it, it's a very sort of tactical sort of strategy that they've got um and and, it, and it's born out of the fact that the people of Earth have decided that they don't want to use spaceships anymore. They're using the transmat. You know, if they were using spaceships, the, the plan wouldn't work. So it's kind of, you know, sort of saying, well, it's all great being advanced, but, you know, it, it comes with its own risks. So I, I do like the fact that it's it, it's very cunning and it's it's picked up on a weakness of of security and of, and of Earth and the way that they're doing things and um, exploiting that, which is really good. I like that. Yeah, I think they work well in this story. Um, and of course, you've got the additional, um, what do you call them, the Ice Lord, or uh, the Ice Lord Sla, uh, who's, um, I think they look better with their capes on when they were in the Pertwee season, I have to say. The, the, the costume's not giving much, it, the costume's giving quite a bit away, I think. But um, yeah, it kind of adds an extra dimension to the Ice Warriors. Um, uh, obviously, it's you know it was a little bit of stunt casting for the Ice Warriors originally, wasn't it? With Bernard Breslau there being cast as one of the Ice Warriors, but Steve Peters and the team, um, and Sonny and Sonny Calvin is um, yeah, they, they, they put a good turn on. Um, and I, I really big, I'm a real big fan of the Ice Warriors. Um, a lot of chasing sequences with the Ice Warriors, and they do seem to go in and out of that solar power room and not spot the person who stood right in front of them several times throughout the episodes. Yeah, I think I think there there are moments where, where doing that means you can't be seen, and that, that's fine. That's fine. They've got limited vision. They're tall. I'm tall. I don't often see small people when they're doing things. It's, 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 it comes out of how it rolls in the territory, especially, especially um, if they're doing this. Especially if they're just talking. And you got them. and you got Dudley Simpson's drums in your ear. You're not you're not gonna you, you know. I mean that I think his music in this is incredible. I, I love his his bombastic sort of I love all that. I think he really adds to the ice warriors. Um Alan Benyon obviously becomes straight straight from the offset. I think he 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 owns that. He, he's working under all the latex and stuff, and he does a tremendous job. Kudos to, to the lovely Sylvia James for all the, the latexing and the work on there, because that all looks incredible. And it doesn't, it doesn't, I don't think it's dated, it doesn't look cheap. No, it, it looks great. They look like sort of you know lizardy people. Um so yeah, and I do you know, think I love about actually all the staff and the um, and the project and the team at is they've all got beautiful vowels. Everybody, everybody speaks so properly. It's incredible. I love it when when um, Martin Court um, he's he's about to get killed by an ice warrior. He's doing a desperately he's wearing desperate peril, and he's kind of like oh gosh, he doesn't he doesn't drop he doesn't drop the diction. And I and and I think I sat there just admiring that everybody speaks so beautifully. In the future they can't they can't itv2 must stop happening at some point soon and we get get our vowels back well the the it's, it's the curse and the mumble isn't it now it's every drama just has someone go, you're just like what did they just say and if you turn it up you you know seconds later you're going to get blaring dialogue or blaring music so this is maybe just an old thing of me but i i, I do despair when i just hear mumbling on a drama, this is just like, what, what, what am I supposed to be listening for? Um, there's some great, there's some great uh, performances in here. Um, first one I'll call out is um, Gia Kelly, a, a really strong female character, which, you know, we've talked about before, you, something that some stories of Doctor Who really 
don't have. But she, she, you know, right from the beginning, she has this authority about her, and she's not, you know, not afraid to to throw herself into into the situation. So I, I really like um, her performance. She, she, you know, even with her superior, she threatens to go over his head and sort of, you know, say, oh, "I'm gonna, I'm gonna get what I want, um, and you're not gonna stop me." She's really quite a nice feisty uh feisty lady i think james is avoiding saying her name isn't he i thought that as well <laughs> it's fine it's fine we had to because because i for years thought she was louise padjo because i presumed that would be how it would pronounce but but in the world of phantom we meet these people and it's like so, so how do we how do we how do we how do we, how do we, how do we go with the name she, and she said it's payu 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 was the pronunciation um yeah she says it sort of comes back she's got uh, well actually listen to the phantom audio commentary on the mars attacks who talk she does all her heritage on there when when she was over i mean she's she, she sadly passed away now but she was looking into her family tree and she said she's quite quite a viking heritage so quite fascinating she was a very forthright lady and she was very pleased um that if you if you check this it, it's a fact They've all got little badges on, haven't they? The the, the team at people. And she was, said she was very pleased because she got three balls. She said nobody else at team at control had got three balls. She got extra balls. All the men hadn't got as many balls as she had. And she was quite pleased with all that. I'm sure Ronald Lee Hunt wasn't too happy with that. Well, bless them. I mean, Bobby, I love Bobby, Bobby Bartlett's visions of the future. And she, again, phantom, phantom drop. Um, she she got some, she she went on actually to do uh, generation games. She used to do give us a twelve, and she'd do all the big frocks for that. Um, but her space designs are incredible. And and but yeah, at the same time, it's slightly unfortunate. I do think the the sort of black tape, sort of emphasising where your pants would be look yeah. for some of the guys. It, it, it's, it, it's not it's, flattering, are they? For some of the actors, they they really <laughs> not. No, they're, they're, they're not. And I, and I think, I mean, they're more flattering than anything they've got on Dolkis. But the, there, are, there are visions of the future where it's like, um, I, I hope that's not what's, what's coming back for us. And I Maybe love the fact is. that they, they all walk around with briefcases as well. Very, very official. Yeah, we don't have space travel. We've got instantaneous pods which can take us somewhere. But we've got a briefcase and we've got a clipboard. <laughs> It's difficult, though. I suppose you, you're never going to be able to accurately predict, you know, and so you're always going to have these just little bits of things like a telephone or something where it's like, yeah, we don't, we, we don't do that anymore. It's but nice to know WH Smith is still going it's in the far future. Selling WH Smith will outlive everything. It will still have its 1998 diaries at 25% off, hoping someone's going to get it, and a Shane Ward book on the, on the clearance section. That's still. What could you want? <laughs> Um, and I was very sorry to see the the early demise of Harry Taub in this as well as Osgood when he's uh, he's deliberately sabotaged the apparatus on the moon there and uh, he gets zapped by the Ice Lord, which isn't very good. But you know he's a great actor and and, and I actually um, I like him in several things that I've seen him in. He always gives us good strong performance. So I was quite sorry to see him leave this story quite so early on. The first episode, I mean, I, I like all of it. First episode, I, I, I love all the, the build-up because obviously it is just called The Seeds of Death. I don't know because I've not checked whether the Radio Times put a picture of the Ice Warriors and said Doctor Who faces the Ice Warriors this week. Surprise. <laughs> uh, but I, I, I like it. And the, the little bit where, where something's happening and they run into the team at control, uh, no, the, the, the moon control, and you, and, and you get the, the handheld sort of shot of, of the ice warriors approaching you don't know what they are and you hear the breathing you wouldn't necessarily remember the ice warriors from the year before you might have really seen the ice warriors before um so i like all that and i like the reveal at the end so I, uh, all that sort of stuff's really well done michael is an incredible director i love all of his doctor who's um and again he does his shot i mean it's a shot he does again for the ambassadors with the reflected light but the ice warrior can go over is it Hampstead here? Is that some, yeah. some is it? i made so. that up the ice work again you get that you get he knows how to shoot from below and to get the refraction on the on the light and all that and yeah incredible and i think he does a, a remarkable job on this yeah he even makes the chase sequences look um you know when they're running around all the different sort of corridor bits he, yeah he's got a great touch i think and um you're right about them them sort of point of view type camera angles that he's that he's running particularly as i said with as you said with the reveal at the beginning it's it's really well done 
and there were i mean it's quite surprising what we we end up with considering there were some issues with the writing the script um i think pat troughton had to miss an episode um and terence dicks had to sort of jump in and, and support and and sort of get the story to, to where it needed to be so i think you know we, we talked on the previous one about how but, you know they were sort of scrabbling to get to the end of this season and although you you've got a really good episode a really good story and it fits together really well there were still issues with the sort of writing of this behind the scenes but you know when you've got performances that um you know even though pat was on holiday i think he was on holiday or just had a week off or he wasn't well yeah. but you know he's missing for one of the episodes but you know We've said this a couple of times already on the previous season six um, videos where we've talked about um, the stories. You know, this TARDIS team is on fire throughout this season. And, you know, even, even in the bad stories, they, they, they shine above it. But in a story like this, they really, they really are well settled into it. You know, they've got a good, strong cast around them. Um, they've got plenty to do. And um, it, actually, for a six-parter, it's a little bit padded, but it does it does roll along at quite a pace. This one, you know, when you take out the the numerous chase sequences and the the visits to the solar power room, there's there's, there's quite a lot going on for another six-parter here. And you know, this is a season that's got long stories in it. So you know, to be able to um, keep that rolling for six weeks, ah, you know, good attempt, you, I think. You've got that different dynamic of the different locations where there are scenes going on so you've got the you know the control center then you've got the you know the um team at uh site then you've got the weather center as well you know the, the, there's lots of different um bits of the story going on in different areas so yeah there is a little bit of you know oh we're back to where we were before you know running down corridors in the space station on the on the moon base or whatever it is but it's it doesn't drag too much i think the sort of underrated performance this is terry scully i think he, he, he yes he's got such a a, a a style a sort of an edge to him and you you, you really feel that he's, he's he's slightly pathetic but 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 he's just been dropped in the wrong place hasn't he and and, and he's wrong he's dropped in the wrong place at the wrong time but then he becomes the hero of it doesn't he because he saves everyone, sort of in spite yeah. of Miss Kelly being very dismissive of him because he's not as efficient as she wants. And she's she, she's the efficiency, but she hasn't got the humanity. And he's not got the efficiency, but he's got the humanity to an extent. So Yeah, he turns the, re the recording on, doesn't he, as they're saying their plan. And they know he's done it, so he knows he's going he's gonna to be killed. But he, you're right, you think he's a traitor because he, he does seem to be snivelling and sort of going along with what the Ice Warriors want, but it, ultimately he does, you know, help save the day. I mean, you're right about the performance, and as you get later into the story, you know, he's clearly, he's clearly realising he's in a hopeless situation. He's, he's, you know, he's tried his best to help. Um, although he's looked like a traitor, he's just trying his best. Um, like you said, he's in the wrong place at the wrong time. But you almost, there's that scene where he sort of sat in the control room and he's, he's on his own at that stage. And you can just, he's just by the way, he's just playing it at that point. He's folding in on himself, you know, and he's just giving a, a fantastic um, performance, I think, throughout. On the subject of alternative stories that were going to be here, Lords of the Red Planet was one of the ones I think that was brian was uh looking to do which was a genesis of the ice warriors sort of story um which you can listen to um big finish have done a, a version of it um john dorney adapted it it's good it's a good listen actually i don't know how it would have worked on television you know when you listen to them sometimes you think i could see how this would have been done at you know um, that would have been six sets or whatever yeah you could, i don't know how it would have worked on television but it, it's worth a listen it's nice it, it's um it's fraser and wendy and um uh, charlie hayes isn't it so it's uh it's a compliment to Padbury's there for you and Michael Troughton. So it's, it's what, what could you want? That's like an endorsement link and I don't even work for Big Finish yet. <laughs> I do the voices. I can do the voices. I can do them all. <laughs> and, talk, and talking of voices, John Whitty, amazing name. And I love the computer voice. I love all that commander Radna. I love all that. <laughs> Is it, are Unless, you going to be your audition tape soon for Big Finish? So I would like to be. I would like to be the computer sound of Teamat, please. 
Um, so I could do a, a message from the United Nations, congratulations and all. I, 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 I love it. It's great. He's... And, and the different tones and levels and excitement. The computer gets quite excited at some point. Yeah, it's about, and compare that to the computer in, in, in the Ice Warriors the year before. You know, mm. Rubbish. You just span around. <laughs> Oh, I actually want, it makes me want to be in the team at world just to hear that. You'd have a briefcase and some gaffer tape around your trousers. <laughs> oh. I probably would. That's, that's, the, that's the next cosplay, is it? <laughs> yeah. But yeah. We're all together. Yeah. <laughs> I want Miss Kelly's hairpiece and three balls. That's what I want. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, well, I, 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 th I think we, we, we've, got, we've got two more stories to come up. So I, I, I think, are we heading towards score on the door, Doctor Who? And the seat? Oh, no, I forgot to ask. Yeah, we've covered, we've covered <laughs> the, the facts as, we, as we've been going through. Um, just a, a, interesting to, to know your, or get your thoughts on the ending, because it's quite, the Doctor's quite ruthless in dispatching the Ice Warriors at the end and i know we talked recently about uh a certain six part adventure that has just aired and the the sort of there's dispatching of the cybermen and the daleks and the sontarans what do you think about the sort of killing off the ice warriors and the fleet as well i don't think he's committed genocide though has he i don't think there's any inference that it's all of the ice warriors I mean, otherwise they'd, they'd be buggered for Paladin. Where would they have come from? Yeah. <laughs> Just one left. Tucked to the way for safekeeping. I get the, I, and I could be misremembering all of this terribly, and forgive me if I am, but the inference later on, I think, in Paladin is that there are factions within the Ice Warriors of the nice Ice Warriors who want to be peaceful and yeah. the ones who want to be on GB News. So I, I think... <laughs> Maybe these are bad ones. And I, I don't know whether the moral compass says it's all right to, to melt the unpleasant ice warriors. But then yeah. I suppose, you know, Doctor Who is, is, is about the good and bad and the sort of the sweeps of it, isn't it? I mean, in the moon base, we have the thing, don't we, where the Simon bounce the earth rocket onto the, onto the, to the sun and butcher mm. them. It's kind of, it's high stakes. The, 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 the ice warriors in this are intending to just basically destroy the world with their, their inflatable balloons and, and foam. Mm. Um, so short of talking to them nicely and saying, please don't, please don't do this to the earth and please don't invade with your ships. I suppose you've got to sort of say you, you, you've, you've taken the, you, you've taken the it's, action yeah. that you're going to be doing this. Mm. But in the response some respects, to saying. In some respects, though, it's no different to something like the end of Evil of the Daleks, because essentially that you know he he brings on that sort of that sort of almost civil war with, between the between the Daleks at the end that, that brings about the final end, so to speak. So you know, I think it's been prevalent in Doctor Who for for years that you know ultimately sometimes to defeat the alien race, the Doctor has got to blow them up or do something to them. Um, I think the scale that we saw it on the um, flux was was something a little bit different. So, you know, I, 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 you know, you've got to get rid of the baddies in some way, and they were lurking around the, around the dark side of the moon there. So, you know, it's going to be a fleet. Got to blow them up. Got to blow them up. Fair enough. Homicidal Clifford, that is. <laughs> <laughs> got to blow them up. Just got to blow them up. Blow them up. It's, blow them it's up. all right. Because I mean, come on, you've, you've only got another two stories, and then we have the the ultra sort of moral third doctor who's like, oh no, talk. Talk to them all. Talk to them all. They'll all be all right. They might be trying to wipe out the planet, but that'll be nice. If you have a chat with them, they'll be all right. Just, just have a little chat. So, you know, I suppose it's just different shades of, it's shades of morality, isn't it? Mm. It is. You know, the, the, the Ice Warrior slaughtering toll is quite high, isn't it? They, 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 they merrily they, they, get rid of a lot of people. Quite a bloodthirsty episode. So. I feel I feel like um, I should do the He-Man thing and turn the camera and say, remember kids, do not wipe out <laughs> alien race even if they attack you. Even if you're Jason, kill them all, Clifford. <laughs> Jason, kill them, Clifford. <laughs> this is gonna They're going to have a Cobra meeting. What do you think, Jason? Kill them all. Kill them all. 
<laughs> anyway, do we have any scores for Doctor Who and the Seeds of Death? Yes. Yes. Well, do you want to give them over or we'll be here all night? <laughs> okay. Um, I'll go first then with my score for the Seeds of Death. Um, Team at the Ice Warriors and another brilliant season six story. Um, there's not an awful lot to not. There's not an awful lot that you you can't like about this. It's it's a great six part story. Um, doesn't sag too much. Um, you've got the team on the top, the TARDIS team on top form. You've got brilliant guest cast. You've got you've got you know you've got the Ice Warriors. What more do you want? Um, so for me, um, the Seeds of Death is sitting in there as a very solid. Eight and a half. Oh, we're back to the fractionals, are we? We're back to the fractionals. Oh. <laughs> Do you need a COVID passport to go to the fractionals? I don't know. I don't know anymore. <laughs> oh, I was waiting for him to say sparkling again. <laughs> I know. I was waiting for sparkling and it's a four. But what happened? I don't know what's well, happened it's, to it's not, I mean, it's, it's a good story, this one. Um, it's beyond sparkling. It's a very, very solid eight and a half, isn't it? More sparkling there, soda stream. Mm. Oh, do you know why I had one of them as a kid? They were brilliant, weren't they? As a, as a kid, they only came out in the seventies. Okay, <laughs> James. Uh, yeah, I, I likewise. I I like this story. It is. Um, you know, there are, we talk about six part episodes. It could be a little bit tighter, but I can't really imagine taking much away from it. Um, great cast. Great performances, and I scored it a very creditable eight. You see, there was, there was just that moderate, moderate delay there where I have to do my, my, my Susie Danting. Susie, she does the words. I always get it wrong, but I watch it enough. I'll go for Carol Vorderman. I'm, I'm just Carol Vorderman. Um, Rachel Riley, that's what the kids would be really? saying, isn't it? Yeah. You two old Marys aren't going to help me with getting any names, are you? Oh, no. <laughs> Louise Payou all over again, isn't it? Just leave, leave it in the, in the atmosphere. <laughs> right. Well, <laughs> I think my, my booster jab has literally just emptied my head because I can't seem to do two plus four here. Um, I love The Seeds of Death. I, it is one of the ones... It is one of the... I, I'm, you know, I'm going to... Paraphrase Jason, but I actually have some backing here. Um, it is one that I would watch quite regularly. You mm. said it about the ten Oh, this is one I'd always go to watching. It's a fine. <laughs> what was that all about? <laughs> <laughs> you know it. Anyway, it's he's a death. i always I love I love the the, the what's it and remember the thrill of getting the the first um because the first DVD wasn't vid fired, was it? it? Had a vid fired clip on it, or was it just vid? For, I don't know. Tomb of the Cybermen wasn't vid fired and it got a clip on it, so maybe Seeds of Death was. But then it got a special edition anyway, and then it can come out on Blu-ray. It's not got a, it's not got a vinyl though. What's what's happening anyway? Seeds of Death. I like the Seeds of Death. I love the music. I love the style. I love the directing. I love lots of the performances, and I think it's great. And I think it's a six part that goes with a good, better pace to it. Um, I give the Seeds of Death nine. Yay! Ooh. Good yeah. score. Did, did, it, just, did it lose one because it didn't have a vinyl? <laughs> I, I I don't think it's a ten. I think I think you know. In I, I think I know in my stony heart when it's a ten, and it wasn't quite. A t I, mean, I I I do love it, but it's not a ten. And I think if I my especially because we've done this sort of because we've done this in order. If I'm given a 10 to the invasion, I know that the Seeds of Death I don't like as much as the invasion, so it can't be a 10. Whereas I guess if the invasion wasn't in this season, I might have been a bit more like, hey, it's the Seeds of Death, it's a 10. <laughs> Whereas I think, I think when you do them in a run, you, you, you're very conscious of what you scored the last few stories. I think yeah. if someone came at me now and said, you gave 20 to Sontaran experiment. I'd be like, oh, so that means I like that more than the Crotons, but less than the. You know what I mean? So I think, I think within my schematic of this season, <laughs> I'm giving it a nine. But I'll kill you, everyone else. <laughs> I tell you what, these scores though are doing this season for us. I know we've got a couple more stories to do yet, but you know, it's highlighting, I think, quite how consistently um, 
good these stories have been. You know, obviously we've got one or two that we, we, we've scored low, but, you know, we've got three stories here that we've scored relatively high. Um, and I think that that sums up, I think, the overall quality so far of what season six has been. And so we move on to the penultimate, <laughs> the penultimate story of the season, and that is the Space Pirates. So I, I, want, I want the caption to have uh, the extra... Ex- I, want, I want all Space Pirates. So, Space Pirates, who's got a pre-scripture on this one? Well, I may have a small piece there. But a small what, Jason? Anyway, um, <laughs> just while we're on the subject of the, the quote marks around the names, they just couldn't make it up through this season, whether the story title should have the quotes around it or not. And they did, in fact, in the Space Pirates. Um, so, okay, we have just said a few seconds ago there how high the standard is this season. And it does dip a little bit here, I think, as we come into this story. Um, we seem to have sort of high, low, high, low, as we seem to be coming through um, the season. A bit like play your cards right this season, isn't it? Um, with more high than low. But the Space Pirates, where do you start? I mean, um, the, I don't even think I can even read an intro out for this, but I'll give it a go. So the Space Corps are in conflict with the Space Pirates. Um, who are out raiding Argonite minerals. And um, you've got, I think you've got pretty much a bad Star Trek episode here, if I'm honest with you. That's what it reminds me of, is a pretty bad Star Trek episode. Um, because it's, it's got this, it's, it's certainly not six episodes worth of material we've got here to start with. Um, it is a shame we're missing it. But having sat through the... Um, the loose cannon recon on this one um, because I was intrigued to see whether or not my opinion would have changed from the last time. Um, I don't think it has particularly. Um, it's just very long. It's just very drawn out and it just lacks, I think, a little bit of plot somewhere in there um, for it to be, you know, even if it were returned, I don't think it would necessarily be, you know, the season pinnacle in any ways, the change particularly because, you know, this feels almost like a Dr. Light um, a story as well, because it feels like the the main protagonists, the, the Space Corps, the Pirates, you know, Clancy and the Liz 79, they're all taking more or less the center stage here. And, you know, it's 15 minutes into the opening episode before we even see the regulars. They land, like the, the TARDIS materializes 15 minutes in, and they're sort of thrown into jeopardy pretty quickly. And they seem to just sort of mooch along in the background there, getting caught up in the dramas that are going on around them rather than um, necessarily controlling the dramas. Um, so yeah, it's it's a different sort of story to The Seeds of Death and uh, 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 that's my starter for 10. I mean, they, they spend two episodes sort of trapped on the, on the capsule, don't they? After the, after the pirates raid and the TARDIS gets sort of blown off into one capsule and there and the other one um and i think because they were doing um outside uh recording for war games the final episode is just pre-recorded inserts so you know you, you're right that the crew the TARDIS crew in this one were not there for for the whole six episodes um the, the whole idea behind the the script is robert holmes wanted to do this sci-fi western he you know um you've got uh milo clancy who's, who's supposed to be like a prospector kind of uh character it it, it doesn't really work though i mean i, I can see what the, the idea behind it is uh, and you know maybe it's because we don't have it we can't we can't see it but it, it doesn't really kind of fit together. And, they, and everyone thinks that, that Milo's, you know, part of it. He might be the ringleader of the pirates. And then you've got the sort of uh, the plot that actually it's not him, it's someone else. And it, it just, yeah, it, I don't have that many positive things to say about it. I mean, I, I, I can only go by what I've read and the one episode that, that exists. Um, but yeah, it, 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 and the only reason 
why the I mean there, there was there was starting to swap the film processing over as well so it was what it was one of the last stories that was filmed at Lime Grove in the tiny little studio um the rest they'd started moving to the BBC so they had they, you know they did have better facilities uh episode two was recorded uh on 35 millimeter film which is why we've got it because the BBC were like well this is the first time we've done that for Doctor Who so it's it's historically significant. Not, uh, not that, that's not a true fact. I'm sorry. I, on my I, film, there, there, there are several. Um, Dalek Evasion of Earth, episode five, is on 35mm film. Power of the Daleks, episode six, I think, we in space. But it was saved because it was on 35 It was Well, basic, basically, um, um, the, the BBC junk Doctor Who because it was on videotape, but the film yeah. library had film, film recordings. So... Mm. Uh, as as the crow flies, they would they sh they should still have other films, so they should still have like powers. Of, but as 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 a rule, that because it was a film recording, it went to the film library, whereas because it was videotaped, it went. Like, Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, no, that's right. Yeah. Get it. Have a look at the Richard Molesworth book. It's a great read. It's got it's got all that detail in. I've read it a few times. It's it that, that's that's the gist of, of why these these and and, and ironically, um, when they did find a. a recording of VHS but like a home recording from this era it was Space Pirates episode two that they they found so it's like you know a week either way we'd have had another episode um I think it's a slight unfair thing to come at the Space Pirates for having a lack of the regulars because by this point Pat was really not having it he was not having the amount that he was doing and he didn't like that if they had a day off they were having to do pre-filming so it was very much a I don't want to be doing this show anymore it's it's too much for me and you're asking more of me in response so Space Pirates is very much a controlled measure in taking some of that load back and I suppose trying to lighten the mood I guess because it, it I, th I think by this point things were not you know so so hot in terms of, of you know he, he wanted to go um because it's a, it's a talking bear recording, I'm basically going to say that I disagree with everything Jason said, and I would flip it the other way back. And I think I came at looking at the reconstruction thinking, I'm not so struck on the Space Pirates. I, I, I think bringing it back would do nothing for me. I've watched it now, and I think I like the pacing on it. And I think if we could see it, I think we would like it a lot more. And I think the biggest thing about the Space Pirates that I think we are completely bereft of is Dudley Foster, who is an incredible actor. Sadly, left us early. Um, left us early is a terrible term. But if you look it up, you get what I mean. Yeah. Um, he's an incredible villain in this. He's an incredible villain in lots of things. He's, he's amazing in Steptoe. He's in one of my favorite Avengers episodes. He's in um, Wish You Were Here with, with Louise Payu from the previous story. Um, he, he's, he's, he's an incredible actor and he's got such a snarly menace. And I think we've slightly got enemy of the world syndrome here. I think episode two is possibly the worst of the six. I think the first one you've got the setup with the pirates. I mean, we've got, we've got the only episode of the space pirates without the bloody space pirates in it. It is, it is, it's, it's like about as, as ridiculous as you can get this. It's like, you get none of them. You don't get Brian Peck either. You get none of that. So you get none of Episode two is, is sort of like a shunt. It's, 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 it's not a great episode. Um, I, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not saying it's, it, when it came, if it came back, it would be a 10 out of 10 and people would adore it. But I think, and I remember on the Troughton Years video, I'd often sort of get to the Space Pirates bit and think, oh, I'll, I'll cut my <laughs> losses and, and wind the tape back. But I love, I love the progression of the story. And I think watching the, watching the whole thing, like, I love it, you know, I think it it does it does go places, and I like the the transition of uh, like Madeline goes from being sort of glamorous and glamorous sort of good girl to the revelation that she's the baddie behind it, but then she's not quite the baddie behind it, and you know, but but throughout all of it, Cavan is brutal. I mean, he shoots Zorba down, and goes, "Anyone else want to die a hero?" And that's the cliffhanger. I, I love all he he he's he's nasty. He's He's ready to kill uh, Domestu. He's got the bomb planted in the Liz and always going to suffocate them. Or he's, he's nasty. And I think, again, we're sort of, 
we often say, and we have said already in previous ones about, about the sort of regular performances, and I think there'll be certain things, and there's lots of stuff in Dom, Dom Segre's office, as for instance, where um, Jamie has to explain candles to Zoe. Zoe, who becomes more violent progressively, just to clarify, this story and the next one, she, she, gets, she gets a bit Clifford. She's going to kill them all. Yeah. Um, she, or, she does her first teapot smash in the space pirates, where she, she gets one of the guards over the head with that. Um, so she's got she's got the super brain to sort of kick ass, beat him with a bit of chinaware. Um, but now I, I think I think we're we're bereft of not having better better representation of it. We've got no tally snaps. We've got a handful of photos, and the photos are all from the first episode, aren't they? So they're they're the, the space pirates on the ship and the Doctor in that very small part of the of the um, beacon. But I, I like something I Zoe works out where the beacon parts are going and she's got a point if Jamie obviously can explain the candle service, who's got a little bit back on. I, I like I like a lot of it. Um, I mean there are some odd parts. I <laughs> I can't I can't quite tell where Donald G's pitching it in terms of you know, it's a it's a very I, I suppose he's being a space hero, but it's I, I don't know where that um, quite goes. And I think Jack May, Jack May has got a very unusual, he does a very unusual delivery, Mr. Seagree, but he does do all of it with a lot of conviction. And I think... Yeah. Available for Big Finish. <laughs> See, I, when it comes to the Space Pirate Chronicles, I could, I could, I could be her, Mac. <laughs> We're going to be too late. <laughs> and, and the other thing, Ian Stu, is that the, the spaceships, the model work is beautiful. And normally you find if something's too well cleaned up, um, you see you see a lot of like, oh, don't clean it too hard. The spaceships are all on 35, but they, they look beautiful. And I think that's such a big part of this as well. So when you get to the, op I'm not going to try and do the operatic. I, but when you get the operatic spacey music, and the spaceship shots, I think that would look beautiful. And I, and I just, I, I, I mourn the lack of visual for it because I don't think it's a story that's made to be listened to. And, and I, 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 like, I like it. I like the space pirates. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I can see a lot of what you're saying there and it is in counter to some of what I've said. And that's, that's, you know, that's how we are. That's how we roll on talking about. But I think I think the episode we've got, you're right, doesn't give it the justice that I think this story probably needs. And I'm not a massive fan of following stuff from an audio perspective, as I've said a, several times. So possibly there is a little bit lost in the delivery there. Um, it does feel like it picks up pace towards the end of the story, particularly when you have got a lot of the stuff that's going on down in the mines on the planet Tar. Um, and you know, you've, you've got, seems like quite a lot of action going on there. So I can imagine that visually that's good. And obviously Cavan's coming into his own there, particularly uh, in his particular murderous way that he is. Um, so, you know, yeah, I, I don't disagree that probably with, with some visuals, it would pick up a pace and, you know, I'd probably look at it with a different eye, but, it, and you're right about the model work. I think the model work is exquisite in this and, um, it sets up a standard that we probably hadn't seen in Doctor Who up until this point. Um, and it's interesting because it's all on a starless background as well, which was very akin to mm -hmm. what we understand to the Apollo 11 um, uh, mission that was around at that stage. But yeah, you know, it's, I just don't get it from the audio. I think that's probably a part of where I'm coming from. Um, I, you know, I, I don't know. We're all, gonna, we're all gonna have slightly different opinions on this story. I wasn't telling you you had to agree with me. I was just saying that I was disagreeing with you. No, 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 I, I, I agree. I mean, I'm open, you know, I went into this with a view to, I, I thought, right, I definitely want to revisit this because, you know, um, often I, I might, um, you know, I think it was important to do season six properly and, and go through the, the, the DLC recon on this one because I wanted to just see quite how it fitted in. Um, but I think it just, it's... I just don't, I just can't get it, I think, from what I've got from a source material perspective. Carl also um, politely said Dan Neely's performance. I like, um, I like her performance as a big, big film star. She was also um, Debbie Watling's mum in The Invisible Man. So there's a little Doctor Who link 
back there. Um, no, I, I, yeah, I think I, I think even because um, I think if you watch um, if you watch the first episode um, with Milo Clancy, I think well not the first, the one we've got. His performance seems a little bit weird and comical, and it doesn't. And you think, what, what is this playing at? But if you if you follow it through for the rest of it, I think it makes more sense. I think in isolation, it looks a bit weird and his egg and all that stuff, and you know, I ram them and all that. It's kind of like it's a bit cringy. But as it goes on, and you realise that there's more to the character, yeah. I think there's more mitigation for how he is in that episode. Do you not? Do you know what I mean? I think. That there's, there's so much, it's, it's difficult because I suppose in some ways approaching any of these reviews, none of this stuff is stuff, I mean, I'm talking myself here, I don't know, whether, none of them are things that I've not ever seen before. So I've got a pre-knowledge of at least elements of it. Mm. And so if someone's bad at the start, I know they're going to be, you know, good at all, you know, I know where it's going or what the, so I think... Uh, there is a point there, isn't there? I, just, I think, I think, I think, if we could see the full progression of his his yeah. like, on screen, I think we'd probably be more forgiving mm -hmm. rather than just if you just put Lost in Time on and see this episode two and go, shit, is that what the Space Pirates is like? I I think it's 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 a, a difficult thing, but you're not going to get everybody that wants to watch a reconstruction because it's, it's it's not mm -hmm. easy. So I guess maybe forsaking a, a, a return of any sort. So I suppose the future of this is an animation. And, and at some maybe, point. Yeah, and may, maybe an animation is what, what might get people to stop and go, actually, oh, no, actually, there is more to this than... Because I think, again, and I, I, I will stop rambling, but I think sometimes there are certain Doctor Who stories where it's very easy to go, it's not the twin dilemma, just because it's kind of like the, the perception isn't questioned. You go, oh, it's not the space pirates. But it's just kind of people don't necessarily engage with them because they're predisposed to them that it's going to be a bit cack. And, and I, I think there's a lot here to take away. I'm not, I'm not saying it's the best thing ever. I'm not saying it's the best in the season. But I think there's a lot more there. And I think, you know, a visual would be what, you know, saves it. And the enemy of the world proves it to a degree, um, because I don't think we talked about enemy of the world in the same way as we do now. So you're right. It, possibly would change um, some perceptions of it, I think, to be able to see it. Um, even in animated form, I think it would help me, I think, that's for sure. And the director, Michael Hart, went on to do a lot of crossroads, so he's got a good pedigree. Is that why he gets the title of space opera, then, I wonder? Well, because Nolly Gordon should have been playing this e <laughs> Oh, I, I would have wept, I would have wept for that. That would have been amazing. That would have been brilliant casting at the best. Tony Adams could have been Donald G. It, would, it, it could have all. It could all happen. And it could all happen. Milo could have been <laughs> Benny then. In that instance, it, it was made to be done. We could have swapped out Wendy for the week and had Jane Rossington. I mean, why stop? Why stop there? So, I don't know whether. There's going to be an awful lot anyone else wants to say about Space Pirates now upon his monologue. Has Not, James got uh, any magical facts? No, I, I covered them already. Um, no. I mean, it's not even well served by the novelization. I mean, Terence literally churns this out in about 110 pages. It's, it's, mm -hmm. it's, 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 it's not a great read. It's, it's a very workmanlike sort of knockout. But I think... Am I? Mm, I'm gonna make. It was some originally match. there was going to be a different story called the Dream Spinner, but that was dropped due to technical issues. I I, I think because the funny thing is, just to do a very quick phantom anecdote, whenever we used to have Terence and Barry at events, panels would always be about how much they love working with each other and each other's work. Uh, and after Barry passed away, we did a panel with Derek Show and then Terence Dix. And the panels were basically about how much they hated what each other did on the show. So <laughs> it would sort of go on the kind of st stem of, you know, you did that one and that was crap. And then Terrence would be like, yeah, but you did the Space Pirates one and that was really boring, wasn't it? And you kind of, <laughs> they, they would both come at each other for doing bad things on the series. Um, so maybe that's why Terrence sort of just phoned the novelization because it's like, oh, it's one of Derek's scripts. I think I'm not here for this. But it's a shame. I do, I do, think, I do think, dear listener, viewer, Mm. Have a little look at the Space Pirates again. So do we have scores? 
Uh, yeah, I'll, I shall. I shall go first. I mean, I did. I did only watch the one episode. I didn't sit through the whole reconstruction of it. Um, you know, I, I watched uh, Wendy Padbury talking about it. Um, it. There wasn't. And part of me really wants to say yes, Paul. I I agree with you, and I want to see it, and maybe I will change my opinion of it. Um, but I still only scored it a five. Okay, that's not that's not that's not a bad score, is it? Oh, bad score. Um, compared to some of the other missing stories, it's it, it's 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 a roundabout or a little bit lower than I would would have given it. But it, it, there's a lot that is missing for me to sort of get my opinion of it fully formed so let's hope they do an animation in the future so to put the caveat let's hope they do a good animation in the future <laughs> okay okay uh i'll go next then with the score um all right so you know uh i think um it's very clear that I don't see this as one of the best stories of the season by any stretch. And I do think that my view on the story is, is driven in part by the fact that I can't watch a visual on it. However, I did sit through um, the six episodes, uh, five of those being recons, because I wanted to give it a, a run. And, you know, I think, unfortunately for me, it still feels quite padded and quite paced out, um, spaced, uh, spaced out a little bit really from a, from, from a six-parter perspective. I think if it was tighter, if it could have been done as four parts, I think it might have been a little better. Um, I think there are some good performances in here, um, but there aren't, there are some not so good performances in here. Um, so, you know, all things being equal, I don't think my opinions particularly changed on the Space Pirates over where it was previously. It possibly could if we get an animation or a return of the story, which would be amazing. Um, and in which case, my score for the Space Pirates sits in at four. Oh, you, you were giving me a look when I gave a five. I thought you were going to go seven. Oh, four. Which is still more than he gave the Dominators, and you can see that. So, <laughs> um, just yeah, just for I, 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 I think were I on were I a, a twenty year old on TikTok, I'd say as a space pirate stan now. That's what they call them, isn't it? Is that what they call them, stans? You're so down with the kids. I'm a stan. I'm a space pirate stan now. Um, yeah, I'm down with the kids, and, and I'm also dressed like I'm going to pick mine up from school. <laughs> um, anyway, um, Space Pirates Me, I don't, I, I, you know, I don't think it's a glistening classic. I think it's uh, a better than average story. And I think we, we I, 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 it's on my list now. I, think I want to see more Space Pirates. I might get the t-shirt, I might get the Clayton Red Bubble now. I'm, tattoo, no, I'm getting a tattoo. <laughs> oh my God, I have a Space Pirates. No, anyway, Space. so Space Pirates, I am giving six and a half. I've gone okay. fractional too. Wow, you are on the fractions. That's that's a new thing. Yeah. Which which brings the space pirates out at 15 and a half. Mm. Is it enough? enough? Is it enough to take the top? <laughs> it's not our lowest story, though, I don't think. Is it? Or is it? Or isn't it? Oh, Honestly, okay. I think the vaccine's appalled me now. Get your booster, <laughs> kids. Um, we're on to the next story then, which is the last of the season, the last of the era, last of the six. This is the last before the Doctor goes to Division and becomes a Division. No, no, we've done. Oh, uh, oh no, it's the war games. That. <laughs> we're stuck in the flux. <laughs> we're stuck in the flux. So anyway, the War Games, which I'm, 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 I'm confident is, is is what we're talking about now. Um, Who's, who's got a script for the War Games? Uh, well, I, I don't really, but I, I shall go because Jason's like, oh, it was my turn last time. I can see him doing the calculation in his head. Um, yeah, it is, I, it is time to say goodbye. It's time to say goodbye to, to Patrick. It's time to say goodbye to the entire cast. It's time to say goodbye to Black and White. You're going to burst uh, into song in a moment at this rate. 
<laughs> I mean, they they literally have thrown everything in the kitchen sink at, at this story. Um, and I know we, we talked earlier on about how the budget had been used for, for other stories, but this this is still an, an epic, you know, ten-parter, which... I mean, the, the, the story itself, uh, I, I know we'll, we'll talk about elements of it, you know, it, it, it's quite an ambitious story. You know, I quite like the idea that there's all these different time zones and they've been capturing people from Earth and putting them down in these time zones to, to, to watch them fight and, and everything. And, it, and that, I find that idea really well realised. We find out more about the Time Lords um, than we have done previously, um, you know, and we introduced the warlords as well. Um, yeah, it, it, there's. Does it go on too long? Maybe, maybe just a little bit too long. Where they're sort of like you know, escape one zone, then end up going back to that zone, and then escape, and then go to another one, and all the different characters that they come along, uh, you know, interact with along the way. There's some really good performances, I have to say, um, from the TARDIS crew, but also from the likes of um, Noel Coleman, Edward uh, Brayshaw. Um, you know, th there's some really, yeah, I really like their performances uh, as well. Um, and, and some of the sort of, you know, little leaders, if you like, the little sort of bosses that they have in each of the, the different time zones. So, yeah, it, it's... It's an ambitious story, I would say, um, and a fitting epic story for Pat's final, well, you know, he'll be back, but for his final story as the Doctor. It's interesting. I think it's sort of epic by accident, though, isn't it? Because it's kind yeah. of, we've got to the end of the, enough things have fallen through that we've just got to got keep peddling this. We've just got to keep this story going. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so they're slightly lucky in a lot of ways. Terence and Malcolm, both obviously great writers for a, 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 you know, any sort of get us out of this hole. Um, that their idea does allow, admittedly, like you said, there are kind of elements of we've gone to this zone, we're back to that zone. And there's a lot of back and forth, which, again, you know, as, as we've often said with this, if you were watching weekly, you probably wouldn't think, well, hang on, didn't. Didn't, didn't we go to the Roman zone three weeks ago? Yeah. Haven't we seen them running over this hill before? Is this, is this the same footage? I, I you, you, you sort of forgive that because you'd be, I guess, within, you know, within the viewing, you'd be, you'd be like, oh, you know, this is part of the story. And this is, this is how telly is, you know, time slip at eight episodes or something. You know, they feel a bit saggy now, but I suppose it's forgivable the rep repetition in some ways because of the format of the show. Um, it's been it that you know for watching it live watching it go out you know week after week there must have been that sort of like amazing moment when you realize that the only way the doctor was going to get out of this was to to, to contact his own people and we, we hadn't really i don't think you would have picked that up though in, in, if you watch this week in week out because you really don't start to think about the fact that he's he's in a he's no in no a, i mean at here. the end i mean at the end when he has to do it i don't mean you would have sussed it earlier I, I just mean you know from an event point of view in Doctor Who the point where he has to say I'm going to call in my own people to to help me you know where we hadn't really seen or you know, we hadn't even heard about the, the Time Lord so this was like a big moment you know we've just been talking about flux and how that may or may not affect the history of Doctor Who well this is one of the defining moments of the history of Doctor Who you know it it's certainly a defining moment, that's for sure. Yeah. I mean, if you think about the importance of this story, I mean, it's it's. I, I, I think just talking about this story quickly, it's 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 epic in the ambition of how what they set out to do. They had ten weeks of television to fill because everything else had fallen through, and Terence and Malcolm Hulk literally um, pulled this out of the pulled this out of the hat as a story. And you know they were they were filming it while they were still writing the scripts for the latter episodes. So I think epic is a great word to sum this one up. Um, but when you think about the importance of this of this story in the history, um, episode ten of the War Games 
is probably as important as as the as an unearthly child episode one of of the very first story six years previously and it closes a full circle loop because you start off with them you know escaping or effectively having to escape London you know he's then run out of options to this point and he has to call the time lords in that episode 10 is probably next to an unearthly child one of the best single episodes of black and white Doctor Who um, because of what it reveals and because of um, just because of the helplessness of it and and you know it's the end of an it is really an end of the era and it closes out the black and white era you know as we opened up in 63 it closes out in 69 um yeah one of i mean if i was scoring that one episode alone i know where i'd be scoring it so we'll score the entire story got into trouble the last time i tried to score that one one and, and that that but it is singularly one of the most defining episodes next to an earthly child for me mm. Because it wasn't actually a guarantee it would be back. So to, to an extent, no. episode 10 of the War Games is almost the last episode. And, and it, it would, if it were Dot Who not to have come back next year, it would have been a sort of quite an, a, a bleak end. It would, but it would have been a, a conclusion because it would have been the end of the storyline. Um, I, th- I think the, the clues to the Time Lord sort of involvement are, are, are laid nicely throughout. Because I think... Uh, the, one of the, the the nice sort of bits constructs of the of the of the piece is that when it lands when the TARDIS lands, you don't know that it's not landed during the World War. You don't know, and and, and the slow realization that it isn't that, and then the realization that, that there's something a bit like a TARDIS, but it's not a TARDIS. And I, I think it's all played out. And 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 meeting someone else from the Doctor's home planet isn't a, a groundbreaking because we've had the meddling monk, we've had Susan. So to that extent, there, there isn't, that's not high stake in itself. I think it is literally come episode nine where it's like, I can't, I can't fix this. I've got to call the Time Lords in. And it's, it's actually quite casually, don't I've got to call the Time Lords in. It's like, who are the Time Lords? And like, they're my own people. I, it's not a big reveal, is it? It doesn't stand on that. It's sort of part of the, of the, the discourse. Um, but I think... The, the, the magic of the Time Lords in, in, in the part, in the part 10, in part 10, and I suppose to an extent to some of the poetry ones, is they are these slightly ethereal higher beings. There, there's, you don't get the full backstory. You don't get a huge interaction with them. They are just very, you know, there's, there's, there's no moving them. Very stuck. There's a kind of like, that's what they are. There's not a lot. They're, they're, his, they're his people. They don't like him interfering. And that's all you that's all you need. That's kind of all. There's a there's a magic and a simplicity to that. And I and and again, this is you know without getting the stick back out on Deadly Assassin. That's probably where I I start to think this. You're now going back into your continuity. You're going back into your history, and you're developing something that actually it's, it's fine to leave it alone. You don't have to have everything. You can just know that the time lords are powerful, and he shouldn't be doing what he's doing. But they kind of let him get on with it because, on the whole, he gets away with it because he's doing it for the you know, a greater good. And he's slaughtering all the ice warriors. Kill them all, says, just says Jason. Uh, but he, he, you know, he, this is the first time we find out really he's a, he's a fugitive. You know, he, he's, you know, they, like you say, they, they, they don't like the fact that he's doing all this interference. I mean, I, I do love the bit where he's like, look at all the evil that I have faced and, you know, because um, it's, because it's got the quarks in it. Uh, but, but, you know, it, it takes you it takes you through the sort of gallery of all the you know different things that he's taken on. He mentions about the Daleks, you know, describing them as the worst evil that that's out there, you know, and, and he's pleading to sort of say, you know, this is why I've done it. Um, and 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 the Time Lords are quite ruthless, you know. They say, yeah, yeah, it's great, you, you you've done all of this, but uh, we need to still sh- you know teach you a lesson. Um, you know, and we're we're gonna we're gonna force you to regenerate. We're gonna you know we're gonna force you to regenerate, and we're gonna put you down on Earth. You know, we're gonna we're gonna trap you there. And the the scene behind me was filmed before they'd um, secured um, John, so that there was no they couldn't do a regeneration because this was filmed before some of the later scenes. Uh, sorry, some of the earlier scenes were filmed after this, where they had 
confirmed that that John had had signed up. But you're you're absolutely right. At this point, this could have been the last shot of Doctor Who, which would have just been his gurning face revolving, and then that's it. Which is, you know, you, you think about what comes next. That would have been an absolute tragedy if that had, if it had ended at this point. But it does also, um, it's early doors and the time loss picking what they look like, isn't it? Because people get upset by Romana taking her arms in and all that stuff. But they're clearly saying here in 1969, he doesn't want to be this, he doesn't want to be that. There's different races, there's different sizes. So, so, so this kind of notion of um, what the Doctor can turn into. Could he's, you imagine he's, if they, they went back and retconned it and put a woman in there? <laughs> <laughs> but but it's sort of not impossible within within what they're the, the sort of they're offering up there, is it? Um, so I don't think it's as bold a leap as as people might expect it to be. It's just I suppose it's like if you go to the supermarket and you always buy Yorkshire tea, you'll always have Yorkshire tea or something a bit like Yorkshire tea. It takes a brave week where you go actually let's go crazy and have you know Tetley. So uh, maybe that's the doctor with his regenerations as he's got a bit older, a bit older. Oh, yeah, God. I want to try boobs, you know, I don't know. But at least, at least it, it you know, I, I, I think if anyone's upset by it, you do only have to go with episode 10 of The War Games and look, it's, it's not that wild a suggestion. Mm. But I mean, episode 10, it, it's funny that we've sort of drifted quite quickly onto episode 10, when there are another nine before this. I mean, like, it's a long run up to this, um, but lots, of, I mean, lots of great performances within it. David Savills is, is, is a, a great, isn't he? Cast yeah. Um the lovely uh, Jane Sherwin. Yeah. So there's, there's, there's lots of lovely performances in it. And I think um, that's one of the great things, actually. The, the, the length of it does allow for lots of little you know, different characters coming out. Rudolph Walker does a, a, a great yeah. turn in it. But for um, me, I think this is, um, this is one of Philip Maddock's best performances in Doctor Who as the as the war, the war lord, as the they war like lord. to pronounce themselves. But I think it's one of Philip's defining roles. He, he really has the menace of the war lord down to a T. Um, plays well at opposite, obviously, at Edward Brayshaw as the war chief. Um, mm. But it's, it's Philip Maddock. He just stands there. He doesn't have to do anything. He's menacing, just stood really there. Really just with just the way and, and he's got this beard yeah. with this with these kind of points on it and it it just looks menacing and he doesn't really have to say anything i, I think it's one of his i said it's one of his best performances for me in doctor who it's his it's, uh, I, oh god sorry i know okay isn't that the great thing about a really good a really good villain doesn't have to do the sasha thing of going oh i'm the master i'm mad i'm mad i'm evil i'm mad i'm evil if you've got enough power and enough charisma you could just the be there Huh? Was that, did Kenneth Williams play the master? If only he had, I suspect he'd have had more restraint. He'd have given the better performance. I think. I think going over the top, like John Sim, Sasha, John, Sim, any of them, they they all get the footnotes so incredibly wrong. If you look at Philip Maddock, he is he is so under, mm. but he's so powerful. And and in all the scenes, he's. I mean, the, the glasses, the glasses are a nice touch. They do strange things to the eyes, don't they? But such a great performance because because it is so so soft and so so you know cold soft and on on, on a, almost a single level he doesn't really you know he loses his temper just a little bit but it's a very 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 simple he, performance his proper sort of sociopath though isn't he you 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 wouldn't what jason no not jason um but kill you them all. Kill, kill them all kill them all kill them all as you see him, you're like, I, I really wouldn't want to get on the wrong side of him because, you know, he he does, although he's so calm and so collected and, you know, like you say, really underpaid, you could imagine he would have no problem in just, you know, shooting someone right there and then because because he needed to. You know, he, he has got that that chill about him. Um, and and it, is, it is a great performance. I think... And I was, I was, I'm ready to be fact checked at this point. I think this is um, Philip Maddox's only story that's not a home story. I think the other ones are all um, Robert Holmes ones, but he, um, he, it's Brain and Morbius, isn't that? Terence Dix. There we go. I knew I'd be fact checked. <laughs> is he not? Oh. 
Jason's laughing at me like I've just made that up. It's no, I'm laughing because James is saying, I'm quite happy to be fact-checked on this. <laughs> it predominantly it was in Robert Holmes stories. <laughs> anyway. Predominantly. predominantly. And David Maloney, predominantly. It's... Yes, well, I, yeah, I, I think the sort of the measure of that is also the scene where he kills the, the war chief, isn't he? He doesn't, he, war chief is uh, given the full eye, you know, and he, he's very big with his but he's just like, just kill him. He doesn't, he doesn't, he doesn't engage with it. He doesn't even look at him, he's like, kill him. And, and it, it is great, you know, it, it, it's a, it, you know, Philip was great at, at being the villain. I mean, I can remember the, the, the anecdotes made me disgusted that he wasn't the villain in The Power of Kroll, but he still plays it as if he is. He's like, sod this, <laughs> Villains is what I do, you know, don't get me. So if you watch, I watched it quite recently, there was an episode of The Champions was on and I watched it and Philip Maddock was in it and Kate O'Mara was in it. I was like, come on, we know who were the bad guys in this situation. You just, it's just like, it was like television sort of dictionary, wasn't it? Like, who, 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 Kate O'Mara, she's a bad girl. Uh, Philip Maddock, he's, he's, he's basically sort of slightly sort of sinister villain and, and it's great because they were so good at it and you could go around the different shows you could do your avengers and champions and you could do your, your villain and be amazing but also very different to his appearance just a couple of stories earlier in the crotons mm. well he had to he had he, he grew the beard didn't he or he had the beard to try and disguise that he hadn't already been in a story this season um but but again you know they they, they were trying to it was supposed to be a four-parter and a six-parter and everything fell through. So they were kind of like, like let's just put something together. So I, I drew on what was around. I also quite like the squabbling between the war chief and the security chief. So James Bree again, he's turning in, he's turning in a good performance here. They've all got different, they've all got different personalities. You know, the, the warlord's really like, and then you've got these two that are just bickering away um, throughout the story. They really don't like each other very much. And eventually, you know, you get the, you know, the security chief is 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 shot down by the, the sort of war chief, um, and it all plays out. But there's one single, but the one single thing that's constant throughout all of those scenes, whenever he's on screen, is Philip Maddock's performance, and it just stands out head and shoulders. Also, um, Noel Coleman's performance as General Smythe, because again, he's used sporadically through the story. Mm. But he's got, again, that presence of, you know, he's clearly an intelligent sort of, you know, he's some sort of intelligent alien who's, who's planted in there to make it look like he's, you know, he's a general in the, in the, in the 1917 war. Um, but he's just got that whole air about him. It's, he, he's born to play that role for me. Yeah. David Garfield as well, also one of the, 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 great, the great villains of the piece, isn't he? Um, yeah, there are, there, are, there are a lot of incredible performances to, to admire in it. And in some ways, it is a sort of a nine-parter and then a coder, isn't it? Mm. Yeah. 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 But I think because of the length of the serial as well, they were able to get a very, very, you know, they were able to get, a, they had to carry quite a large cast throughout it because obviously, you know, it changes pace and you have different characters turning up in the different episodes they're not in it consistently throughout all 10 so it's kind of useful that they've got a, a, a large ensemble that they can they can draw from here but I think they went for some very you know obviously um you know David Maloney's got his his regulars that he would bring in if he was if he was produce uh, if he was directing a, a program because obviously it's director's choice as to who they bring in um but you know it's a very strong ensemble and it works. And, and again, I think it's one of the it's one of the good things about the war games is that they were able to throw a bit of money into the pot to get to to get some some good names there, I think. I mean, they, they did. I mean, some of the some of the locations they filmed, though, I mean, one of them was Brighton Tip. So, I mean, they, they weren't necessarily spending all the money on the on the, the locations. And it's it, it, sometimes it does does show it's a bit threadbare. The... But, but that's testament to me. That's testament to David David Maloney's work. I've, I've commented on his work several times when we've been when we've been doing these because I think as a director, he's one of the standout directors um, for me on Doctor Who, um, on the classic series of Doctor Who. And he makes the best use, I think, of what he's got there. So, you know, right, he's filming on a tip in Brighton. But um, 
they were very lucky actually because there was a film that filmed there not 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 long earlier that was a war film so they were a little bit lucky there but he makes the best of the environment that he's in so you know all the way through i think the, the shot choice again you know the filming you know there's something about a, a director on Doctor Who. They either got it or they haven't got it. And we've mm. seen some spectacular failures, but we've had some spectacular successes as well. And I think his work is 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 a shining example of when direction is good on Doctor Who. Yeah. Worth noting that Jason spent many a happy night on a slag heap in Brighton. <laughs> oh, that's just rude. <laughs> <laughs> but is there, isn't there also an anecdote about the the, the pyrotechnics and 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 Patrick had sort of said you should always make sure you check how many fingers the 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 pyro man's got because um, some of the explosions on the rubbish were a bit a bit fruity when they were doing the the incendiaries from there. Have a look. I'm sure that anecdote's out there, whether it's true or not. I'm surprised that James isn't able to uh, fact check it for you there. I, I, I'm not. I'm not sure he's going to get a BBC News job on fact checking. I'm not going <laughs> to lie here. I'll be doing the uh, the press conferences from now on. Um, <laughs> there was his own private party there breaking the rules. It's cheese and wine, it's absolutely fine. Um, the, when it was aired in the US, so when uh, PBS showed this story, they they showed it as a four hour long episode, so that it wasn't broken down into the ten. It was just it was just played as a as a as a continuous thing which i think would be a little bit much it's no different to a bloody marvel film now is it bloody hell superman's got to be six hours before we can start <laughs> it's true it's true when did films stop being 90 minutes anyway that's a separate rant there's a separate rant that i'd want to get on to there's a talking about there just waiting to be done yeah I think wasn't didn't dolce wasn't it replaced the week after didn't they put star trek on the week after on pc one yeah, it's very close, I think. Yes, yeah, Star Trek replaced it because it was, again, the longest gap that we'd had between then and obviously the start of what would have been season seven. Yeah. I mean, it's a sad goodbye in a lot. I mean, because there's, there's echoes, aren't there, later on with, with Donna Noble that, that, that she would never remember her adventures and all that. And, and, and this is probably the most brutal sort of exit we've had. I say that knowing that Sarah and Katarina are actually killed. But... <laughs> but um, the fact that, that they they there's no choice for them and they've got to go back to their own lives, but they won't have any knowledge of what they've done. There, but I mean, in some ways, maybe it's better for Zoe that she's 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 not going to be as violent as she's become. She's she's started smacking people with teapots and leading resistance fighters. Maybe she needs to go back to her library on the space wheel. It'd be a bit more sedate. Um, but it is yeah, you know, joking aside, it's a very sad exit for them that they they are both you know their minds are wiped and. They just get to remember the Highlanders and the wheel in space. Yeah, and in fact, um, Jamie then would have no recollection of Zoe at all. And which is sad, very which sad. Which is sad when you do stop and you think about that, because, you know, um, after, you know, after the adventures that they've all had together and they've had some good ones, and, and you can see it's quite, as they're leading up to that point where, um, you know, that the, the tunnels are clearly then going to take, you know, separate them and take them off in their TARDIS. It is quite brutal, this. Um, but, you know, even the doctor knows at this point that it's 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 a full on hope. And they're saying, come on, doctor, we can, you know, we can escape this. We've escaped from we've escaped from, you know, worse situations than this. And the doctor just goes, yes, OK, then or whatever. And it's, you can just tell there's already an air of resignation there that that's where the story is leading to. And it, it is it's it is a bit of a sad watch, I think. We do get to have a little little bit of fury from the deep and a bit of wheel in space. We get get some footage from episodes, don't we? Just just dropped in there that we've got now as examples, which is nice. Yeah. That I suppose the casual viewer may not have actually remembered back then. No, nobody would have questioned why there was web all over that TARDIS light when it was flashing. <laughs> but no, it 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 it's it's it's, it's a nice it is a nice sort of run around for them and it's it, it it is padding, but it's padding in a in a sort of nostalgic way, isn't it? That you know they 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 land a certain amount of times to fill up a certain amount of minutes in the episodes as to how short it is, you know. It's, mm. But and done nicely with the scene when um, Zoe is back on the wheel as well. So you get the flashback of the wheel, and you get that sort of yeah. corridor, and you can almost remember it being like that. It may not have been, but it may was probably was, but it's. Um, it's just done in a really, really nice way. And she's clearly, 
oh, I, I think, oh, I, you can just tell she, yeah, it's, it's just very sad watching. And we get to see Claire Jenkins again. If anyone at home knows where Claire Jenkins is, tell us. We don't, she's one of the few, she is one of the few Dot Who people for whom nobody knows where she be or isn't as it could be, but no, nobody's heard from Claire Jenkins in many months. So let us know where she, she might be watching. So do we have any last facts on Doctor Who and the War Games? Uh, just having a, a quick look. No, I think we've covered everything that I had on mine. Yeah. He's too scared now. He's too scared to, 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 to throw them out there, isn't he? <laughs> like, I think this is true. Don't correct me. I hate you. At least the quarks were in this one, I suppose. They were, yes. And John Levine is John Levine. Is he? Is he the Yeti? In in the in the he's definitely one of them. He must be the Yeti. In the clip, at the, at the end when they do the because because they've got them. There's that lovely photo, isn't there? Oh, Actually, yeah. I thought he used to be on the wall at the Hangochen exhibition. He used to be across the the wall, didn't it? He used to have Pat and the Monsters. He's laughing at me. No, he's, <laughs> I, I love the fact you put a Welsh reference in. You know, I love it. I uh, yeah, he's gone here yeah, now. Just up the Welshness. Yeah, <laughs> it's like when someone says something about Scotland to Lulu, it goes a bit Scottish. I can, I can up, I can up the Welshness even more with my Welsh mug today. That is literally written in English. All right, <laughs> it's got a Welsh dragon on it though. Yeah, but it should be written in Welsh. Where's your patriotism? Anyway, John Levine, I think, is the Yeti. He's definitely one of them because there's pictures. I mean, he wouldn't have been the Ice Warriors. That would make no sense. No. Um, so we've got scores then for the for the finale. Yes, yes, we do. Go on then. Okay, I'm happy to go first. Um, as I said earlier on, epic, but epic not in you know, you know, epic, massive, massive, you know, 11, 12 out of 10 type epic, but epic in the ambition, epic in the fact that they pulled something out of nothing. And actually what you got was a pretty good story all the way throughout. Yes, it's a little over long at 10, um, but it's forgivable because it's telling a story as you come through it. And, you know, I love the fact that you've got all the little different war zones and um, it's clearly leading somewhere. And as a viewer watching it back then would have known what, what it was leading to. We do know it, but it's, it's a slow burner and a slow build, but it's a good build. And I think obviously it leads to what I think is one of the, as I said already, singularly one of the best black and white episodes, um, episode 10, um, just from its defining position. Um, good guest cast, excellent direction. Um, there isn't much not to like about the war games. Um, take it for what it is. It's a good piece of Doctor Who. Um, and, you know, I won't be critical of its, of its, uh, overlong 10 episodes because I think it, it's it's got a good story to tell there so for me the war game sits very comfortably a nine. Oh, she gone big <laughs> okay James where are you on the war games uh well a lot of um what Jason said I absolutely agree with I, I think you know you've got to stand out episode the number 10 you know that 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 bit to me is always like you're watching a you know a, almost a completely different story at the end where where the trial takes place um and it, and it is for me it's it's a, it's another example of out of sort of necessity or you know out of um sort of adversity comes something really good um and in this case you know the, the story yes it is a bit long um, but it is got some really, you know, it's really got some some great performances in, uh, and then we have that sort of ending. So, I also scored War Games a nine. Oh, it's going to go for a ten, ten. It's going for a tense ending, isn't it? It's more tense than the Australian Apprentice, which we loved. <laughs> It's true. It's, it's been on. Get out an iPlayer, people. It's been a lot of fun. A lot of fun. Um, so I am. I'm looking. I'm looking down now because I'm. I should probably give you my score, shouldn't I? 
my score for Doctor Who in the War Games, I, you know, I, I was surprised because it was one of those things that Doctor Who magazine did their poll, didn't they? I think the last time they did one, their massive, you know, vote for every single Doctor Who story, rank them and all that stuff. The War Games was the highest rated 60 story, I think. Yeah. And it, it, it sort, of, sort of surprised me in a lot of ways. I'm like, oh, I think there's better out there. I think mean, we've seen better this season. So, yeah, it's better than average. I don't think it's an outstanding thing. And I suppose there are parts of it that are. Oh, the last episode is really nice. Enough. But I gave the War Games. Get, get ready to dematerialize me. It would be as if I never existed. <laughs> I gave the War Games seven and a half. Oh, well, that's still a good score. That's still a good score. Still a good score. And, you know, I think it underlines a lot of what season six has been here. You know, we have had some lows. We've had some highs. Um, there's something for everybody here. But I think overall, I would call season six a consistently high quality season and a good way to essentially end the black and white era. Um, it, as we've said already, it might have been the end of the series as it as it stood at that point. You know, it's interesting because they, they took a decision that they were going to, you know, change the format or rest Doctor Who or whatever, because the ratings were a bit low and, you know, everyone was losing interest in it. It's interesting when you think you go through season six. And actually, I think it's probably one of the better seasons um, out of the, out of the six in the sixties, so um, it, it is it is odd, but you know I think it underlines what what a strong season we had. I was suppose we're slightly lucky um, because so much of it exists that we can quantify our views on it a bit more easily than some of the other you know earlier material. So drum roll! Now I almost did my little Eurovision thing here because if something tie breaks at Eurovision, they go from the most number of twelves and the most number of tens. So we have got a tiebreaker in the middle of this, but I'm going to leave it as a tiebreaker. So in seventh place and a rock bottom, like Lindsay DePaul and Mike Moran, uh, rock bottom seventh is the Dominators. Pity, pity the Dulcian, Dulcians. Uh, sixth place on 15 and a half is the Space Pirates. I'm a space pirate, Stan, and I am looking at both of you now. <laughs> <laughs> eyes on, eyes on, they're like that. Um, in fifth place, on 16 and a half, it's the Crotons. No surprise yeah. gone there. Yeah, it's in the right place. Mm -hmm. dun, dun, dun. Joint third, both on 25 and a half, we have the Seeds of Death and the War Games. Ooh. Ooh. Contrary. Second place on 26 points, we have the Mind Robber. Our runner up. In, in a lot of other seasons, I think it would have stormed it. it would, yeah. I think in a lot of other seasons, the top five would have stormed this. And which means our season winner, I mean, it was a hard task to beat 30, but it is the invasion. We the invasion. And that's a really good winner of the season. Yes. We, we love a Cyberman. But it's interesting that you've got, you know, three or four stories there that are rated really, really high. And any of those four could have won other season reviews, like you said, as, as we've gone. So, you know, I think it, it shows how, how good a quality season six was. Yeah. When I give you back my Zambian film prints of the Space Pirates, you'll be like, <laughs> oh, my word, he was right. <laughs> Space Pirates found p -Bell. Yeah, I think you've got an inside track here somewhere, p -Bell. Yeah, well, I've only just given back the model stuff just to, just to whet the appetite, that's all. <laughs> Head it in a dad's army can just to play the mind game. Anyway, well, thank you very much, gentlemen. Thank you. It's always a pleasure to be here. Don't forget, you should like, subscribe, and put comments below. And, you know, if you do it live, James will answer you. Um, no, he will. I try, but I, I, I'm not good with the tech. I have to get my PA to do it. So anyway, we will see you again soon. So bye-bye.